Good morning, and I'm very pleased to uh, open the first session this morning, which is uh, dedicated to the Middle Ages and uh, in the Islamic world. And our first speaker is Dr. Majena Zavanovska uh, from the Faculty of History uh, at the uh, University of Warsaw. Marjena graduated from the Department of Hebraic and Arabic Studies at Warsaw University in 2001. And uh, she completed her PhD dissertation at the Faculty of Oriental Studies, Warsaw University, in collaboration with Tel Aviv University in 2008, <laughs> on the topic of the uh, Karite exeget uh, Yefet Ben Eli's commentary on the Abraham narratives in uh, Genesis uh, with a very large introduction which later turned into a book uh, relating to Karaite narrative exegesis in general in the book subsequently published from her thesis. She is now a senior lecturer at the Faculty of History Mordechai Anilevich Center. Mm -hmm. And she is also affiliated as senior curator of manuscripts to the Emanuel Ringelblum Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. She has published a great deal on medieval biblical exegesis, Karaite exegesis, borderline topics of Judaism and Islam. And we are very happy and honored to have her in this session. Well, I am honored to <laughs> this introduction, really generous introduction. Thank you very much. And I'm also very grateful uh, to the organizers for this wonderful conference. It's really a pleasure. I didn't believe I would come here. I would come despite the COVID and all the complications. So thank you very much. And it's inspiring to see how you bring the ancient text in, in dialogue with, with modern issues. It's really like eyes opening. So thank you very much. And now, um, if you one preliminary <laughs> remark, uh, the subject that I will today talk about has already been researched by Joram Erder. So my paper will be in constant communication with his paper. Um, he was more focused on the halachic issues, uh, and I will talk more about non-legal aspects, but of course the subject is overlapping. So, And we also use the same sources. He was using also exegetical text and not necessarily halachic. So I will just add my humble contribution to his research, and I will also mention his um, findings, and at Qatar request, I will also summarize some of his ideas. Now, the thing that we are already discussing, that there is, uh, in the Bible, we don't have a concept of the convert as such, as we understand this term today. And in today, we understand converts are people who accept a new religion or change religious affiliation. In the Bible religion, it's also not a term. Uh, it's actually an analian term to the, to the biblical authors. They are more focused on, on tribal kinship or um, common traditions and collective identity. So uh, the Hebrew term ger uh, actually means an alien or a stranger uh, who does not live in his native land and not a convert. And uh, in this sense, it may apply also to the Israelites who were gerim in Mitzrayim. So it's not actually a convert to Jewish religion necessarily. And Yoram Erd in his paper uh, demonstrated that the Karaites were well aware of this problem of this term and they uh, translated it with the Arabic Rarib, uh, a stranger, and not, not a convert. And he also demonstrated, and then I will summarize his um, discussions, that the Karaites distinguished two, type, two types or two kinds of Gerim in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, which is actually the same, the similar to the rabbinic Judaism, the distinction that they were remained in rabbinic Judaism, that is, uh, they distinguish between a stranger who dwelt in the land of Israel under the protection of the Israelites, they called it uh, Ger or Goy Sakin or Mujawir, and a stranger who joined uh, the Jewish religion, they call it Dachil Kidbin, the one who entered the community, the religious community. And actually, Yoram, Yoram's paper focuses on this distinction very much, how they did it. And I will also summarize some of his main conclusion at the end of my talk. Uh, now, these two categories were uh, juxtaposed uh, with the term of a native-born Israelites, the Israhim. They called it Sarich, 
no, the, the native born Israelites. Uh, so we have, of necessity here, we have a mm, binary opposition. We talked about it, but it's not good to look at the things in uh, you use the binary models, but we have here the native borns and the newcomers, uh, the, sorry, native borns and the others, us and the others. And in the middle, we have this middle category of this others who came one of us, yeah, this who wants to join the community. So we, we have this binary opposition. <laughs> Of course, the car rights also distinguished and made other distinction, but I will not talk about them now. They, they, they were more nuanced, but we, for, the, for the needs of this talk, I will talk only about this uh, binary model with a, with a potential converse being stuck in the middle. Now, given the ambiguity of the term ger in the Hebrew Bible and also in car right uh, understanding and also the middle position of a uh, convert, uh, I will... Uh, and talking about it would it will necessarily require also talking about the uh, relation between Jews and non-Jews. So again, this binary <laughs> proposition. And I will generally avoid using the term converts because I think it's anachronistic. So I will try to, to use only the term gerim. Okay, so if we have this binary opposition between Jews and non-Jews, us and others, so is it possible to cross the border? Uh, what are the distinction? How the Kayats understood the, the differences between us and others? Is it possible to, to overcome the, the border? Uh, of course, the Bible and the Karaites, uh, following the Bible, talk about the chosenness of the people of Israel. They, they, they discuss the concept of Amzgula and Goy Kadosh. And, uh, but it's interesting. I will, I will show you what we think of this. So the first the first, let us see at the term Amzgula, the chosen people, or maybe the, I don't know how it's, what is the good translation for Amzgula, the chosen people? I don't dis- know what Zgula means in the Bible, so you can, <laughs> yeah, so you can anything. Okay, <laughs> so the Karite said that it means that, that, that God distinguished Uchas, Israelites, with some Fadail, which are privileges. But actually, I can, I divide it into privileges and duties because they uh, 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 they talk about two two things. So the privileges are that the Israelites had prophets. It's the only ethnic group who, who to whom the prophets were sent. Also, signs and wonders were performed for them, through them, or for them, which is the, also the, the distinction of the, of Amzgula. Now the divine presence uh, was with them. And even when divine presence stopped being with them, it didn't go anywhere else, which is <laughs> important and the Karaites emphasize it. Yeah, it, it stayed, in, it returned to heaven, but it never went to another people. So potentially it can return. And if it re- does return, it returns to the uh, chosen people. Now they also mentioned the, the special dynasty, the chosen dynasty of kings. But being uh, Amzgula also also entails duties. Uh, there are duties, uh, first of all, serving God. This is the first basic, uh, basic duty. Then uh, the Amzgula should serve as priests, as priests, not only priests in the sense of being priests to God, but also priests towards other nations, in the sense of they say that uh, it is we should teach other nations. And I think it's very interesting because here we have a potential of missionary activity. It is a duty, being Amzgula means you should teach others and bring them to the religion of Israel. Now, um, they also, the, the kind of privilege or duty is that they have to fulfill not only rational, but also revealed commandments. But actually they describe it as a privilege because they say you don't have to rely only on reason, God tells you what you have to do. You don't have only to rely on, on your reason, which may not always be the best means of uh, acquiring truth. And uh, uh, they also emphasize special relationship with God. They compare it to relationship between parent and child or more conventional woman and, and her husband. Uh, so it's also a special relationship. When talking about um, Am Kadosh or Goy Kadosh, they sometimes they repeat similar arguments, but they also add new things. First of all, they said that uh, the Jewish people should be like an angel to the prophets. It means in a sense that they should mediate the divine message to other nations. You are like angels. Yefet says explicitly, you will be like angels. 
yeah, who mediate between me and, and, and the prophets. So you will mediate between me and other nations. And again, this is, I think, a potential for missionary activity. I mean, you should, as a chosen people, bring the light of an enlightenment, the knowledge to other people. And then the, the special relation also means that if uh, the chosen people sin, they God will be more inclined to show kindness. Yeah, so uh, like a dear he uh, uh, Yefet Ben Ali says that uh, God will be like a parent who warns his dear child. Yeah, so God will first warn and only then punish um, his beloved child, that is, uh, children of Israel. Now the interesting, so this is very interesting, I think, the first interesting thing which I see in the sources is this potential for missionary activity that you should teach others. And second, I will tell, I will talk about now that Yefet emphasizes that to be a chosen child of God, to be Amzbula or Lokadosh, you should deserve it. It's not something that just comes to you arbitrary, in an arbitrary way. Yefet says that if you behave like other nations, you will deserve istahakum, istahaktum, but I will not grant you a respite in the sense of a time to repent and that I will not be, I will not dwell among you. Yeah, so you should deserve. So we see, we see here first a special mission, but also this idea of a need to deserve, to justly deserve your position. And then this idea also returns, I will show one more source, I'll skip. Mm, this idea returns in, uh, in Yefet's commentary on Deuteronomy 7, 7. Unfortunately, his commentary on Deuteronomy 10, 14, when, it, when the Bible discusses the idea of arbitrary God's love towards the children of Israel has not been preserved. <laughs> I was looking for it, but couldn't find. But on Deuteronomy 7, 7, he says also interesting things. He says that God chose the children of Israel for two reasons. And the first one is inter interesting for us. First, on account of their obedience to him, because God does not love the wicked, but hates them. Yeah, the second reason does not interest us here. But the first reason is because they are righteous, so they deserved uh, being chosen. So this is a kind of a meritocratic idea. You should, you can choose your position through your own acts, merits, through your righteousness and obedience uh, to God. And I think this also uh, bespeaks of Harrod's engagement with the Mu'tazilite concepts of, of divine justice. God, ju God justly chooses people who deserve to be chosen. It's, it's not arbitrary. Okay. So now the question is whether other nations can also deserve to be chosen <laughs> if, it's, if it's meritocracy. So perhaps anyone can, uh, can, be, uh, can deserve by, by his or her own acts to be chosen. And I would like to address now five like, major questions. Maybe I will not manage to address all of them, but I will try. First, what is the attitude towards others as potential converts? And conversion in general, is it well seen? If the mission of Israel is to teach others, so it should be well seen. Um, secondly, what is the status of converts, whether they are equal or not equal uh, to the native born Israelites? Third, what are the procedures uh, um, of conversion? Fourth, is missionary activity well seen? And five, who can become a convert? So the first, uh, first thing, attitude towards conversion. Uh, we know from the previous research on, on the earlier proto-Karaites uh, texts, uh, so about forerunners of Karaite movements, they, they, were, they were reluctant to accept any contacts between Jews and non-Jews. Uh, Anand ben David based it on the law of uh, forbidden mixture, that they should not mix with, Jews should not mix with the Gentiles. Later, Karaites, and this is uh, my indebtedness to Yoram's research, Yoram demonstrated that they were more pragmatic. They realized that it's difficult for the Jews not to dwell among the Gentiles. It's almost impossible. It's impossible in the time of uh, exile. So they were more pragmatic and they, they rather emphasized that Gentiles should not dwell among the Jews. Yeah, so it's much more easy, easy to, to fulfill this uh, suggestion. But generally, uh, they, uh, they said that the concept should be accepted. And I quote Yefet, he says that Gentiles, uh, we are obliged to take under our protection those who ask for it and want to join our religion. Yeah, so generally positive attitude. And... Uh, it means also that the separation between Jews and non-Jews, it's, um, 
it's not indigenous, it's not genetic, it's not depending on genetics, but it's rather behavioral, if I may say. So it depends on, on the behavior of non-Jews. If they are righteous, that's fine. They can jump, join in and uh, they can become a part of a community. And Yefet indeed emphasizes in different places in, in his commentaries that righteous people appear and may appear and appear in, in other communities too. For example, in his introduction to the commentary on the book of Job, he says uh, that there were in the past a group of believers in the unity of God and people of knowledge who were not from our nation. Um, righteous believers uh, appeared also in our nations. Um, and the modalion of the book, the author redactor who wrote the book of Job teaches us that those who believe in the unity of God and the true believers have always been in the world, but they are not many among the nations of the world. Neither an entire nation nor most of it are true believers except for our nation. Yeah, so the righteous believers may appear anywhere, but the difference is quantitative, not qualitative. Yeah? So, so they are just, the, the Jews are in the majority, or all of them are righteous, while among the non-Jews it's more real phenomenon. Now also in his introduction <coughs> to the commentary on Exodus, he discusses uh, Yetro, and he says as that this chapter about Yetro teaches us about the closeness of the people of religion to the master of, you, of the universe and that they were not people of merits and lineage. You know, uh, uh, as Yetro was not from the world of Jacob. So he assumes he is here a egal more egalitarian approach. Yeah, he, he says that the Bible teaches us that the righteous uh, Ahel Din uh, is a phenomenon which concerns not only Jews, but also uh, all the people. The righteous believers may appear in any nation, if it's not anachronistic to use this term, maybe in any ethnic community. And actually uh, the descendants, uh, genetic descendants, it's not so important. Uh, the Nasab, it's not so important. In his introduction to the commentary on the book of Ruth, he also repeats this and says that conversion is more prestigious than lineage. Uh, so lineage is not, uh, the genetics should not be uh, decisive here, but rather righteousness. And he continues to skip and I uh, um, uh, read the final passage, just as those who are distant can become close to God through their obedience, so those who are close to God can distance themselves from God and his community and become a curse and disgrace. And this is, I think, very also interesting comment because again, first of all, he emphasizes the uh, obedience to God. So the righteousness, uh, anyone who is distant can become close on account of his righteousness. But also what is interesting is going both ways, the chosen people who are righteous. The moment they stop being righteous, they distance themselves from God. So, so they stop being close to God, the, the, the chosen seed of God. So actually the, the, closest, the closeness to God is not something permanent, but it's something that we have to deserve again, this, uh, deserve with our own individual merits. Um, yes, status of converts. You're a murderer, <laughs> demonstrated that halakhically they, uh, they should be treated equally with the, the, the converts should be treated equally with the native born Israelites with some exceptions. And I will, I will not talk about these exceptions. I will send you to, to Yoram's paper about, he discusses this, this halakhi exceptions to the equality. Um, I will just show you one passage how Yefet talks about this equality when commenting uh, the book of Isaiah. Uh, he takes uh, uh, the chapter where it says, and I quote here from, from the Bible, neither let the son of a stranger, uh, that have joined himself to the Lord speak, saying the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Have then have the land in Mel Amo. And so the, the, the stranger should not say this, and the eunuchs, the eun how you pronounce this? Eunuchs. Eunuchs? Eunuchs. The eunuchs should not say this. And Yefet said, this verse came as a revelation from God in response to the claims of the eunuchs who were afraid that they are not uh, equal with the rest of the Israelites. And he says they were not right, and they, they, were, they were wrong. So God sent this message to them. No, you are equal. There, there, are, there is no difference between you and the people of Israel. And Yefet says, and I quote, here's Yefet's statement. And the statement about Gerim is like the statement about the eunuchs, in that they deserved, this prophecy on account of their obedience. Ta, 
Yeah. Again, deserving and obedience. You can you can join in, but you have to deserve for your obedience. It's a kind of uh, meritocracy, which I see here. And and equality between native-born Israelites and the newcomers. And the interesting thing is also that, uh, according to the Karaites, and again, I found in Yefet's commentary because they are best preserved and he commented upon every verse of the Bible, so it's uh, the easiest way to find his response to biblical verses. So he uh, actually, he thinks that this equality goes both ways. So if the uh, children of Israel sin, they become, and he and this has explicitly, that they become worse than the inhabitants of, of Sodom, or they become like the seven nations of Canaan. Yeah. So, so equality really goes both ways. If you sin, you are you are as bad as the wars among the strangers. Um, okay, I will, I will skip the procedures of conversion. We don't have much about it in the exegetical text. I will skip it. If we ha will have time in discussion, I may return to it. And also missionary activity, because we don't have much. I will just say that uh, maybe that Yoram was of opinion that, that the Karaites were much against missionary activity. I see it differently as I try to explain with regard to the concept of Amus Gula. And also when we look at his commentaries, they are full of appreciation of uh, forefathers who, who, who did proselyte like Abraham. And, uh, and he, also, uh, he also appreciated uh, Yonah who, who went to other nations to spread the message of God. So, uh, so I think he was kind of uh, appreciative of the, of the converts. Now, who is eligible? This is uh, more interesting. Uh, the Bible puts some restrictions of who is eligible to be uh, to come to, to to join the religion of Israel, um, and the Karaites were were aware of it. And I will quote from Al Kirkisani for a change in another source text. He says that God obliged us to do various things concerning the matter of distinct nations and people. For there are those whom you, we are obliged to whom he obliged us to eradicate completely, and those whom he commanded us to invite into peace, and those who were permitted to enter into the religion, so convert and become Israelites, and he authorized us to marry them after three generation, generations, like the Egyptians and the Edomites. Therefore, it is absolutely vital to determine the lineage of every nation and people in order to obey to what we were commanded concerning with people and others. So here that genetics, if I may use anachronistically this term, uh, really starts to be important. And yet it also makes distinction, this genealogical distinction between nations. He generally he divides all others, those, those who are not uh, Israelites, uh, into two groups, Achim and Rei Achim. We discussed it yesterday, and I think, I'm not sure if Achim necessarily involves the Bnei Israel. Uh, but, what I see in his commentaries, we see on the on the screen, that he divides the Re'achim, so they are all the bastard nations. They are the descendants of Shem, Yafet, Ham. Yeah, so the, the three descendants, with some exceptions. And the exceptions are uh, all the descendants of Mitzrayim, who can convert after three generations, and descendants of uh, Ebel, who can also convert after three generations. But of course, this excludes the seed of Abraham, which comes also from Ebel's lineage. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, they are all Re'achim, with the exceptions of those who can convert after a few generations. And now we have uh, the seed of Abraham, uh, the Bnei Israel, and, he, and, and Achim, who are brothers to Abraham. And he understands it literally, Abraham's brothers. So Haran, Nahor, uh, from the same family and his descendants. And they are Achim, they may freely convert, as well as all other descendants of Abraham. So from Keturah and from Hagar, and also uh, from Jacob, but uh, uh, not from Jacob, but from Jacob's brother, from Ezel. Yeah? So they are Achim, they may freely convert. They are all those in red, uh, put in red. So they are those who are eligible <laughs> for conversion. Um, um, as opposed to the Rei Achim, these are the distinctions. So it seems like if uh, he's also playing on the on the genealogy, so it also some, so it, it, it is also important to him. But uh, 
the very special uh, uh, the, the, the moment uh, what distinguish now uh, uh, Yefet from this from those who claim the genealogy is so important is that he and other characters of the time thought that they are living in the messianic times and in the messianic times all these distinction are, are not valid any longer in the messianic times Everyone should uh, come and join Dachil Fidin, come to join the religion of Israel. So it's the Geula Megayeret that we <laughs> addressed yesterday. And, uh, and Yoram also touched upon this issue and he brought from the legal text, uh, uh, like a proof text that everyone should convert. He quotes, I quote after Yoram from, from Levi Ben Yefet, the Book of Commandments, where he said that because the Gentiles must convert to the religion of the Torah, and when they convert, all the commandments will oblige them as they oblige Israel. Yeah, this is this, uh, in, in the future, they should all, in the messianic future, they should all convert. Uh, Yoram focused on the halachic repercussions of this, uh, of this conversion and on the universality of the Torah, and I will talk on the non-legal uh, aspects of his vision. So his vision will, is that everyone should and will convert to Judaism, and it also entails that the, those who convert or those who will uh, accept the religion of Israel will be loved, and that in the will be, but must be loved. You should love uh, those who come to, to, to the religion of Israel. He says, uh, even if this bastard nation does not live among Israel like the rest of the Gerim who live among Israel, um, so keep, they will be beloved to the people of, of Judah. Yeah, they, they will be. And then also he continues, the master, the master of the universe will set apart uh, special places for bastard nations, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, and he quotes the, the commandment, love ye, love ye therefore a girl. And if they will love the bastard nations, then all the more so they should love other, other Gerim, who will come into the congregation of the, of the Lord. So everyone should be accepted and everyone should be loved, if you can command love. And his vision is very, uh, the, the Karait vision or Yefet's vision is very Isaiah-like. So very, there will be peace, eternal peace, no more wars. He, he says explicitly that, that the wars will disappear from the world and people will no more need wep weapon to fight with. And there will be no longer division between religions and all the inhabitants of the world will profess John one Lennon. religion. Sorry? John Lennon. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, and not only there will be one religion, there will be also one king, the Messiah. So it That's will less less <laughs> perfect unity and one religion. <laughs> and uh, when the master of the universe will, will avenge the Gog and Magog, they will convert to the religion of the master of the universe. Everyone will convert. And he says in the following, I'm just skipping and choosing the relevant passage, but they will uh, convert to the religion of Israel, Yatkulu Fiddin, nation after nation. Uh, well, so it, it will be like a really massive conversion. And as a result, uh, they will also have one direction of play, prayer, one Qibla. They will all pray towards Jerusalem. Uh, and another uh, consequence, there will be only one language, of course, the holy tongue. Everyone will only speak Hebrew. <laughs> in the messianic times. And he also discussed how it will be done. It's a very interesting discussion, how God will make people uh, know Hebrew, but, but it's uh, different. It, it's, it's interesting, but it's for a different conference. Uh, now, so uh, in a kind of summary statement, he says uh, they will turn, uh, that they will turn their faces to all, towards one direction of prayer, Kibla, and will not know the name of a master of the universe in another language, and will not know another direction of prayer, Kibla, self, save Jerusalem. So, like, perfect time. Now there are uh, small scratches uh, into, in, in this perfect vision of a messianic uh, happiness. And uh, already uh, Yoram Erder pointed out that not all will be equally treated in the Messianic times. That is, the Christians did so much harm to the Jewish people that they will rather be destroyed and not accepted into religion uh, or be extinct. And Muslims will be able to join the religion. But actually, I don't see this in the, in the text. Uh, Yefet is hesitant. Sometimes he said bad things about the Muslims and their potential to convert, sometimes about Christians. And I will bring one passage which actually uh, does not leave much hope to both of them. He says, 
uh, he says about Adam and Ishmaeli, Christianity and Islam, that uh, the tribes of Israel will kill them and destroy as they did to the seven nations of Canaan, which they annihilated and took from them the country into possession. So uh, there are scratches to this messianic perfect unity. He's not mm, perfectly consistent. Now, but the important thing is, to, is also to say that Yefet and the Karaites envision a role in the messianic process to, to, the, to others, not only to Bnei Israel. Uh, Bnei Israel, the, the basic thing that they should do in the Messianic times is to teach. There will be many teaching vacancies because if all the non-Jews convert, they would have to be taught <laughs> Torah and commandments. And he said, really, this ta'alim is important to teach. Now, the other nations will also have their role. They will help the children of Israel to come back to their country and uh, um, yeah, to, ret to return to their land and to their language. That's what he says. I don't know in what way they can help to return to the language, but that's what he says. Conclusions. Um, conclusion. And as I said, I will also uh, said what were the conclusions of Yoram's paper. So uh, first of all, Yoram uh, discussed very much these two, these two concepts distinguished by the Karaites of a uh, girl uh, sakin uh, using uh, rabbinic terminology would be girl toshab and girl tzedek in rabbinic terminology, which in the Karaites uh, uh, view is dachil, the one who, who converts. And he proved that uh, the Karaites did their best to, to, to demonstrate that all the positive biblical references to Ger actually referred to the, to the converts, to the Dachil, who, who enters religion. And all the negative references to uh, Ger Sakim, so the Ger Toshaf in rabbinic language, so it's actually not relevant because they are no more Ger Toshav in the time of the diaspora. So they, they try to, to play with a biblical text and, and really uh, strengthen the position of the converts. Now, uh, my claim to, 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 to Yoram's and my addition to Yoram's analysis is that uh, all the issue of conversion is very much dependent on individual merits. So what I've mentioned, this meritocratic approach that you have to deserve to be, you can deserve, anyone can deserve, but you have to deserve this istahak or yastahik. And also the, to deserve, you have to be obedient, ta. These are two terms which are coming again and again. So it's not the it's not a hasap or nasap, it's not the descendants, it's not genetics, it's rather individual deserving. You have to be to deserve to be chosen by God. And as I've mentioned, it goes both ways. So the children of Israel may stop deserve being chosen. Yeah, they they may be like uh, they were compared to the inhabitants of Sodom with this sin. So they they also have to prove themselves all the time. It's a challenge which has to be addressed all the time. Now, um, why the Karaites were so inclusive? Why they basically said that anyone can deserve to join in? Uh, it might be the inspiration. The inspiration might have come from the external world, from Islam. First of all, Islam is much more acceptant of converts. It's a missionary religion. Uh, finally, the whole world should be Dar al-Islam. So this is the Islamic vision that, uh, that eventually everyone becomes Muslim. So it might be an inspiration from the Islamic culture. It might be also the, the influence may have come from the Mu'tazilat Kalam, where the knowledge of God's unity leads to knowledge of God's justice. And if, if God is just, he treats justly also humans. So anyone can justly deserve being chosen. It would be unjust if God just arbitrarily chose one nation. So it might be also um, um, result of their engagement with a more Nazilite Kalam, this egalitarian approach. But what is, uh, I think, beautiful is that they took traditional theological concepts of Amzgula and they used it or transformed it also in, I would say, in, in, in legal or social uh, terms, yeah, the social justice. Anyone can deserve. I'm not saying that it's a sort of utopian equality. Uh, I'm not saying that they were like a uh, socialistic movement, like, like Mahler uh, claimed once, mm -hmm. that, you know, the equ social equality, but I think there is something, a potential is there. 
But I would also look for the uh, reason for this inclusive approach, uh, for internal reason for, for this phenomenon. Uh, first of all, as a new movement, they had to look for converts. Naturally, they need to attract people to, to, to their movement. And probably that is why they also emphasized the missionary activity of the, four, of the forefathers. Though in rabbinic sources, we also have a lot about Abraham's missionary activity. Mm. But maybe that is also why it was very useful for them to be more egalitarian and more meritocratic, they could say to any convert, you know, you can deserve the same, you can also be chosen, just come and join. Uh, but I think it also comes from their involvement with the Hebrew Bible, from the return to the scripture, from the scripturalism, because the Bible is very, uh, appreciates Gerim. The uh, Bible says that God loves Gail, however you understand this term, whether it is a stranger or a convert, but God loves Gail. Uh, he commands to love Gerim, he commands to treat them equally, and he, uh, the Bible uh, tells us stories about conversion. We, we, we mentioned Jonah, but we also have in Esther, we have it, the verse which says that many people of the land became Jews. So uh, the Bible also uh, describes in positive terms uh, Gerim and the, uh, bringing the Gerim to, to Jewish religion. Uh, not to talk about uh, the prophets who also emphasize, it. Isaiah says that uh, the Bnei Israel should be light to the Gentiles. So Karaites took it really seriously. They have to teach uh, 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 the others the Jewish religion. And now, uh, final observation, it also may be connected with their deep conviction that they are living in the messianic times. And in the messianic times, all the divisions should disappear. It's also, it also uh, comes from the Bible. Uh, there should be universal peace and universal redemption and universal recognition of God. So it might also uh, be connected with their conviction that they are living in the messianic times. And, and, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful and really, um, illuminating presentation with so much original material. So please let us open the floor for questions. Thank you so much, Marjana. That was a beautiful, really interesting paper. I know very little mm -hmm. about Karaites, so it was super illuminating. Uh, I, I jotted down a bunch of questions. I know we don't have time to discuss them. Two tensions jumped out at me within the material you were presenting. One is that between inclusion and sort of Exclusion, for example, maybe you could clarify how there are some nations who are eligible to convert and others not, yet at the same time, you're talking about being very welcoming and universal in attitudes toward conversion. I was a little unclear about the Brothers of Abraham versus what about the other nations. Um, also individual versus community with the idea of merit and meritocracy and righteousness. You're saying this is a theme um, and obedience and you can kind of earn God's love and that should be open to everybody but it seems like that's individual when it comes to which con who can convert in, but when it comes to the Jews, is it the collective or the individual and how do the deeds of one individual Jew redound upon the rest of the community and thereby earn or distance God's love? So I'm, I'm interested in individual versus community there. When you mentioned how there'd be all these teaching vacancies after this final messianic <laughs> ingathering, I was curious about um, the conversion process. So usually there's education going on prior to the moment of conversion. Now, obviously it doesn't stop then, but it seemed like there was some kind of important stage uh, following conversion, whatever the process looks like for them. And lastly, in terms of, I think of Karaites in terms of polemics with the Rabbinite Jews. So where is this, is, do Rabbinite Jews in this time and place, which I wasn't entirely clear upon in terms of broader historical context, have different approaches to these things because they are looking toward non-biblical texts and traditions as well. Um, and last point, are these particular Karai authors having Rabbinite Jews in mind as well when they're thinking about conversion or is it really total non-Jews, whatever that means in this context. So those are some of the things that were <laughs> going through my mind. Yeah, a lot, a lot. Of, I'm not sure if I will, if I will remember <coughs> any, any your questions. Uh, I think this, uh, the question of Achim and Rey Achim, who may convert, they are stuck because the Bible says this. The Bible says who may join after three generation and who are the bastard nations. So they are stuck. They know that the bastard nations are, are, are those. So they have to address the problem. This is in the Bible. 
Uh, but uh, they also acknowledge that the moment of uh, in the messianic times, uh, the gates open to everyone. Yeah, so this is as long as uh, non-Messianic time is concerned, there is the division of him and Leachim. But the moment uh -huh. uh, the Messianic period comes, and I think they were deeply convinced that they are living at the eve of redemption, it's no longer valid. They also quote biblical passages. They said you should love, you should love the bastard nations too. Uh, so I think that's how they solved the problem. You know, uh, yeah. Achim, uh, education prior to conversion. I couldn't find much about conversion and their procedures. Uh, I found something in Kyrgyzstania, I found something in Yefed. They talk generally, they don't talk about, I checked all the passages which are the basis for rabbinic rulings about tefillah, milah, and korban. Yeah, so this uh, fundamentals of conversion. And they don't say much. They don't mention, of course, uh, uh, the commandment to do the Brit Milah, yes. But about Fila, about Kurban, they say uh, what I found that they, that they disqualify those who did not go through the complete process of conversion, but they don't explain what it is. Uh, they say, I uh, will maybe show... Uh, when commenting on Dina's rape, when they comment about the, the Dina's rape, that they say that the Shechemites were killed because they did not join the community fully. But what does it mean to join fully? And and Eliefen doesn't explain. And then in Kirkisan we read that the completion is not that the conversion is not full if you don't remove the epithelium. You know, so it's so it's basically I guess maybe it's a, like Muslim uh, Muslim with Mila, it's circumcision and not the Jewish one. Uh, but they don't say about other procedures. So I don't know what they are. Of course, there are much work to be done. You know, if you go through the halakhic writings, you will probably find more. Um, as to the education prior and after, uh, it's not, I, I don't know at what point the potential converts should be educated. I presume you go, you bring the knowledge to the non-Jews and then they decide to convert and then you continue to teach them. The Stalin is very important, but they don't say when it should start and when it should stop. You know, they should be, uh, uh, it says that the uh, Israel should be like rain of wisdom to other nations. Yeah, they should just bring the wisdom to everyone, but he doesn't say when exactly in the process of conversion it should come. Um, so with a rabbinite, you know, it's hard to compare, but it's probably it would be necessary to check halachic sources to compare with the halachic uh, rulings concerning halacha, which are much more clear to me. <laughs> um, Individual versus community. Um, again, he's not explicit, uh, but he, he just generalizes that the Jewish people in general are much more righteous than other nations, and that's why God chose them. But still, they also may uh, sin, and then they become. And it's again a generalization. He don't talks. He doesn't doesn't talk about individuals. If they sin, they are like uh, the seven nations of Canaan. But he does not. He does not say, and he does not say how much, how big percentage of the Jewish people need to sin to to take them all as the inhabitants of Sodom. So uh, it's hard to say for me. More questions? We have until 50, uh, we have two three more minutes. Is that okay? Please. Um, also, I don't know much about Karat, so whatever. Uh, my question is historical, like what is the historical context? Was it really like only theoretical discussion in Exodus or was it really, we have other documents, it's, we know something about uh, what's going on. And also about the peoples, uh, for example, in Ovinic sources, it's not clear whether these people still exist or they actually were mixed up already. So is this like also a theoretical discussion or they identify specific uh, peoples as Edomites or what the implication of, of that to real life, if at all? Mm -hmm. And also about um, Esther, about the Mikiadim, did they see it uh, positively? Like, because it's not exactly conversion, it's more like people were, um, so, out of fear. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, they don't comment much, but they say, of course, that but, but they say that some of them converted out of fear and some of them converted uh, for other reasons, because actually I can quote it from Mr. Yevet says, that among them there were people uh, from among their enemies having converted to the fate of Israel for fear of a sword, and other people converted when they saw the Jews' good fortune after having been at the ex extreme of end of ignominy. So this is okay. This is um, uh, or I think it's ambiguous mm -hmm. because uh, you know joining religion because you see good fortune. It's not very like lishma uh, <laughs> leshem no, no, but you see good fortune because God chose yeah. those yeah. people. It's not just that they happen to have good fortune, but that God chose them. So that will convince you that it is but, better to become a Jew. But it's fine. Yeah. yeah. As to uh, theoretical, I think all this discussion of Achim Achim is theoretical because really they were convinced that they are living at the Messianic time. So it's no longer relevant. So they don't have to check, like we talked about the Hasidim checking genetics. They don't mm -hmm. have because in the Messianic period, you don't have to, to deal with it anymore. Also, the bastard nations are invited into uh, the community. Uh, documents, you mean documents about conversion? Whatever, whether they you know did something or whether you you we heard here in the conference about for example from Paula about stories about conversion or you know some I some relation to any something sources that... about stories about conversion but actually it's also addressed what Paula said Paula said uh, whether it is internal uh, directed towards Jews or other communities I think it is directed towards uh, uh, Jews very much. Uh, to convince them that we are right. So is it so, conversion? Like if not, you want to That's why I didn't want like... to use the word conversion. It's actually bringing people, make them dachil, enter, come, uh, realize that the truth. Yeah, it's like an honest quest for truth. And they thought they found it or knew it better than, than the Rabbanite Judaism. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just wanted people to realize it's not conversion to teach them and to make them realize it's a big teaching mission i would say charism right it's they were themselves studying intensely the scriptures and they wanted to bring their knowledge to others but of course most Jews were interested yes, in this kind of study thank you thank, thank you, you so much uh okay quickly uh i was wondering whether the, the emphasis on Obedience, which you mentioned, was connected to the Muslim context. The religion of being Muslim is to be obedient, to be, you know. So Very I was wondering, that that's one question. And the other question, it's about the notion of uh, religion. We translate deen by religion. I said they know. enter into the religion, into the community. I don't know how to translate it. That's why I said at the, at the beginning that there is no, in the Hebrew Bible, we don't have religion in the modern sense of the term. So I'm I'm at loss. I didn't want to use the term convert. I did use the term convert. Uh, we, we just lack probably proper terms. Uh, maybe it would be easier to speak Hebrew and then mm. you just not translate Ger and Din and... Yeah, but in this case, they speak Arabic. They speak Arabic, which is... notions have yes. a certain meaning in the Muslim world. So yeah. the notion of Din uh, brings us outside of the biblical world into a different kind of world, which is the Muslim world. And, and then, I don't know if in the Muslim world this really means religion. This is something that could be debated, certainly. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because I think this could provide a key to, to change paradigms. To look at things uh, through somehow through Muslim lenses, like through with different models in mind in the background. And that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's why I was talking about also Mu'tazilite perspective. But they were, yes, they, they saw it through. And I guess that the concept of deen in Islam influenced the way they read the concept of deen in, in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. And actually, it also influenced our reading of deen. So I think, yeah. Thank you, it was fantastic. Can you be more specific about what the concept of din is in Islamic, in Islamic thought? Um, Just din, I think it's, question it's more it. religion in the sense that we understand it today, but probably they are better experts. Uh, I think you can yeah. translate din as religion. You have in medieval text din and daula, and the religion and the state yeah. as um, natural benefits. If if I'm speaking, may I ask, do they use the term dawa? Dawa? Dawa. Dawa. Um, it, 
in, that was the call to, 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 to yes 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 they use and I, so i'll show one more interesting thing with this uh, uh when i if i remember correctly they use this term um when they about talk about missionary activities that Abraham did, or no matter the text, I think he uses this term that they called for, for, for and actually he also uses the more Tesla terms because we they called for religion for uh, for also for justice. Uh, he uses really yeah here al adl wal tawhid. So they, they called for justice and monotheism, which is again very Islamic, and, and summoned people. And, and he, I think he uses this term. So, any more comments, Moshe? A question about do we know anything about uh, historical reality and whether there are any converts into Karaism from non, non Jewish, non rabbinic circles? And I, and the second is that I am quite surprised by the immense of implied rabbinic tradition uh, that with the verses you quoted are, are exactly the same verses in which the rabbis used when they interpret their own conversion models. So it's uh, almost like it seems almost like um, this strict uh, schism. Um, they actually read the Bible through rabbinic lenses, which are suppressed, I would say. If in, in so, Gersaken and Dachel, it's all like like the deep rabbinic categories and deep rabbinic understanding of the Bible, like um, um, Isaiah fifty six, are just assumed and presented as if they are direct interpretation of the Bible. But they're actually embedded in 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 in, in the Karait Karait perspective that you presented, uh, and I'm I'm quite surprised to see it. Yeah, but I'm uh, I think the Karaites really, for a long time, felt themselves part of the same Jewish world. Just in my view, at least, they felt like the Aharai in Islam, the people who have their own opinion. They still belong the... to the large Jewish word of people discussing the Bible, but they've had their own way to discuss. They were aware of the rabbinic concepts, they read rabbinic texts, if you may use the word rabbinic. Uh, they, of course, they are in constant dialogue. They just have their own opinions on certain matters, but it doesn't mean that they rejected everything. I, I'm not sure if it's suppressed. It's like adding their own level of interpretation and their new mm -hmm. new concepts. There was a great deal of consensus, so to speak, yeah. between Karaites and Rabbinites, and they, they built differently, they explained differently, but beneath the summit, you're the, you guys are the Karaite experts, but I think, as I've read it, the 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 a lot of it is built up. It depends which also which writer. Some were more brave to extend in other ways, but there's an assumption in a number of what I'll, we'll call halachic areas just for now, where the, the basic assumptions uh, really cohere, and then there are developments, but there's a, a basic uh, common discourse, uh, at least at the, underneath. So you, that's what you call suppression. So, but it's not, you're correct, it's not suppressing it this way, it's just sort of having this tashtit, this uh, yeah. infrastructure, and then how do you build it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they really felt they are the true original Israel, they mm -hmm. felt that the Rabbanites sometimes distorted and mm -hmm. went apart, and they kept a fidelity to the text of the Bible, but they, you know, but the Rabbanites sometimes uh, get lost, it doesn't mean that you know, that you just reject everything that they do. Mm -hmm. We will let this conversation uh, continue, thank you so much. And uh, I'm now uh, happy to call Dr. Moshe Agur and present him. Uh, Dr. Moshe, Rab uh, Dr. Moshe Agur is affiliated, <laughs> <laughs> affiliated uh, research fellow of the Mandel School for Advanced Studies, right, in the humanities at the Hebrew University. And uh, he wrote his thesis. Um, on um, proselytes, apostates, um, and uh, social boundaries uh, of the Gniza society in the 10th to the 13th centuries. 
and he has published widely on the topics that are directly relevant to our conference um, in terms of his discussions of uh, rabbinite and Jewish uh, communal identity in medieval Islam and uh, community borders uh, among the Jews of the medieval uh, Islamic world. So uh, today he will be discussing proselytes, real and imagined in medieval Egypt, a view from the Cairo Gniza. You have your full time <laughs> and you have the discussion time, even if we go over a few minutes. So feel relaxed. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I would like to open with uh, thanks to, to the organizers, Katel and Michal and Yael, and for all the participants. It's been uh, a great, just a great conference. And for me, the first in person conference, oh. yeah, real live three days. And so, <laughs> and very enriching. So, thank you all and for the um, combination of um, different periods, including modern issues and different. Thank you. So, um, now, I would like to open uh, my talk today with an apology to the organizers and to <laughs> you, the participants. Uh, initially, when this conference was uh, first organized uh, two years ago, I gave a tentative title as follows. Integration and suspicion of emancipated slaves in Jewish communities of medieval Egypt. Time has passed, uh, the conference was postponed, it changed my mind, and I gave a different title, which now, uh, first of all, I read. Uh, but here I am, and you see the screen here, and we have a third title <laughs> on the screen. So I uh, would like to take, the adva take advantage of the confusion and uncertainty of the title of my talk to talk about confusion and uncertainty of converts' identity in medieval Egypt. Um, so since our conference puts at its center the social status of, of converts, I, as a social historian, will use various kinds of Geniza, uh, documents from the Cairo Geniza, to demonstrate uh, what we do know about the actual status and challenges and horizons of converts to Judaism in medieval Egypt around the 10th, the late 10th to the middle 13th century. So in the documentary Geniza, yeah, it's working. Um, I've um, thus far found more than 150 documents mentioning converts to Judaism. Some of the occurrences uh, are about a passing remark, a giyoret uh, gets a charity from the public funds or a, a private letter which mentions Ben el Ger, the son of the Ger. Um, others give us names, dates, and occasionally uh, some details or even a story. Uh, but first, we have to ask, of course, as we did uh, this conference, what do we mean when we say converts to Judaism? And for this, we have to first clarify uh, what terms our sources use. And the Cairo Geniza documents are very consistent in using two distinct terms to describe those who were integrated into Jewish society and religion, Gerim and Meshucharim, which we uh, already discussed, proselytes and emancipated slaves. So uh, as we heard yesterday um, and the day before, non-Jewish enslaved persons purchased by Jews undergo a partial conversion to Judaism. They dip in a ritual bath, males are circumcised, they must observe uh, Sabbath, uh, eat kosher food, etc. Yet these people are aware, as Maimonides described it following the Talmud, no longer Gentiles not, and not yet Jewish. So... It is only upon man, uh, emancipation by the Jewish owner that the enslaved became uh, not only free, but also Jewish full members of the Jewish community who could choose a new name, marry a, a Jewish partner, and if he is a male, study Torah. But if we are dealing here with two distinct terms for two different and distinctive legal and social procedures, why am I taking them as a whole uh, in the first place? And the reason I chose uh, to combine the two kinds of converts to Judaism is exact, exactly that, that we have here two distinct and socially legible terms used quite, quite consistently. And while the social processes and therefore the legal procedure uh, by which these people eventually became Jewish uh, is uh, or in, indeed different, at the bottom line, they achieved the same legal status, converts to Judaism. And as far as I'm aware, there is no legal difference between emancipated people and other converts to Judaism after their conversion. 
and correct me if I'm wrong in the questions and answers. Um, yet the different social process before conversion led to different legal procedure and more importantly, a different social status after conversion. Examining uh, cases of proselytes and emancipated people side by side enables better understanding of the ways in which members of the Jewish community conceived conversion and converts, and it throws both kinds of converts into sharp contrast. Also, in a social reality in which there were two different um, dis distinct populations of converts to Judaism, this fact definitely influenced the possible actions of Gerim and Meshucharim due to the mere existence of an alternative parallel path to Judaism, as we shall see. So first, let's talk about uh, the differentiation and then uh, about the influence of this situation. So, as I said, there are, um, there are many dozens of occurrences uh, of the term ger, gioret, also gera, by the way, um, attached to names of proselytes. You can see some of them here on the screen. And there are many other dozens of occurrences of the term meshuchar, meshucheret, in Hebrew or in uh, Arabic to the Arabic, uh, el atik, el matuka, and so a few other terms, and so forth. Uh, this proves that there, um, there were two widespread and well-known uh, terms used by the members of the Jewish community. But can we be sure that the terms were used distinctively? Or perhaps some of the occurrences of Ger Gioret in Geniza documents actually refer to emancipated people. This is indeed a possibility, but I believe that the social differentiation, as I will now demonstrate, makes this possibility unlikely, except for several cases that we'll see. So um, the term meshuchrar is found attached to the names of emancipated people, even decades after their emancipation, right, which is the conversion, and even in the next generation, uh, the son or the daughter of the Meshuchar. For example, here you see uh, the um, example above. Uh, it's, a, it's a bill of divorce. It's a get for the daughter of uh, Muafak HaMeshuchar. Sittel bites, but Muafak HaMeshuchar. So Muafak was enslaved, was emancipated, married a Jewess, had a child. This child grew up married and then was divorced. And he is still termed in the legal document as Meshuchar, and this is not the, the only document. Mm -hmm. And it's not a, a, not a question of um, social status or economical status, because the example below, you see Bundar Meshuchar, who um, wield a huge fortune for several social causes, for the Shiva in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and for many others. So you can be a very, esteemed member of the community, but you still have a shukha. Um, and even, like I said, then generations after, generations after even um, decades after, or even a generation after, uh, as opposed to the term son of the girl, um, which is um, mentioned only in a head, handful of documents. So this is one difference. Another important fact is that quite a few of the emancipated people are mentioned as the emancipated of so-and-so, or who used to be the slave of so-and-so. And here mm -hmm. I'll give you a few examples. So here you see, uh, this is a, a legal document, a, a financial transaction, and it, she is called, the, the woman uh, is called Sittel Room, Shehaita Shifchat HaMechune, and it's Ibn Abul Hakim, never mind. Uh, so, so she was the, the slave of so and so. And now she is, she's doing businesses. She sends the partners to Syria, but she was the slave of so and so. Um, another example is here, Muhtar uh, Meshukhra. So this is the legal term, but Aladikan Rula Madunenu of Yatara Koenagon. He was the slave, or, or literally the boy of, uh, of our master, the head of the yeshiva. Um, this post-emancipation affiliation of a full convert to Judaism, to a former Jewish owner, is not in line in Jew with Jewish law, which explicitly dissolves any ties between the emancipated and the former owner. However, that was not the case in Islamic law, which mandated the long-term relation between the emancipated person and the former owner. Uh, to the point that the former owner was entitled to a part of the emancipated face person and states after he died, after the emancipated wow. person died. 
So the Islamic legal reality left its mark on the social Jewish uh, social reality of the Jewish community, contrary to Jewish law. And I think we can even see it uh, linguistically. So here is a ketuba of uh, this woman, Mu'taz. Mu'taz meshukhrevet Rabbi Moshe Bar Paltiel. So she is the, the, who was emancipated by so-and-so. This is from late 10th century. And this is Hebrew, and I believe it comes directly from the, from the Arabic. Um, for example, here is another letter, it's a commercial letter, and it's the, the writer is Faraj Maula Barhun. And Maula is an important Islamic legal term, uh, the term of how you term the, the emancipated um, slaves, or, or the emancipated person after he is no longer a slave. So what is he now? He is a Maula. And, and the, 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 I forgot the Arabic term of it, but this, um, the dependency the interrelation between the former owner and the former slave now that he is emancipated. So if in Arabic, the Arabic, he is Maula Bahun, and this is not the only example from the Geniza, in Hebrew, we'll call him the Meshukha or the Meshukha. Um, okay, wait for a second for this one. Um, it was manifested not only in the use of specific terms, but also in specific cases in which former owners saw themselves as entitled, former Jewish owners saw themselves as entitled to the emancipated person's property or as responsible for their well-being. Uh, this is another sign or reason for the differentiation in terms between different kinds of converts to Judaism. And one uh, last point, this is a list of deceased from like a two months in, in Infostat in Cairo in the, in the 12th century. And one of the deceased is uh, um, the slave uh, in Arabic, in Arabic is Jariat Rali Abat Aaron Kohen Hamashukheret. So she was, she is the slave. She called, it's called Jariat, the slave of so and so, but she is emancipated. She is Meshukheret, but she is still the slave of, right? She's not even the Meshukheret of. Okay, another hint at the social difference between Gerim and Meshukharim can be seen in the documentary trail they left in the Geniza. Emancipated people received a bill, um, received from the court a bill of before, uh, I'm sorry, a get a bill of emancipation documenting the details of the emancipation, when, where, by whom, um, as well as the basic rights and privileges the emancipated could now enjoy. And I quote, this is Koitan's translation from one of these bills. Now you belong to yourself, you are permitted to join the community of Israel, to adopt a new name in Israel, and to do what you like, as do all free persons. Neither I, Avraham Kohen, in this case, nor my heirs after me, nor any legal representative of mine has any rights over you or the progeny that you will establish in Israel. And note the Meshukharat of and the uh, Maula of. Um, this document is a bill of money mission for, for you, for me, and a deal of freedom according to the law of uh, Moses in Israel. Mm -hmm. So far, I have identified 12 such uh, complete or near complete bills of emancipation, which are actually also conversion certificates. Uh, and these enable us to give face and names to the anonymous Meshukharim. These are actually the oldest surviving conversion certificates, uh, not only in, in, Judaism, in Judaism, but also in Islam, as opposed to formularies um, of conversion. Um, the validation of emancipation with a written document is in line, all this, I mean, in like rabbinic forward uh, world. Um, the, the validation of emancipation with the written document is in line with Jewish law and uh, in Talmudic and Gaonic sources. But rabbinic law also mandates official court documents to be given as part of the conversion process of Gerim. Mm -hmm. Yet we have not a single conversion certificate of Gerim from the Geniza. Okay, and from what I know from other sources, medieval, medieval European sources, they are much later, I think 14th century, if not later. Um, now, let me rephrase it. We do have one description of an actual ceremony of conversion to, to Judaism from the it includes uh, immersion in a ritual bath, accepting the commandments, and it's signed and witnessed uh, by the Jewish witnesses, but this is the conversion ceremony of an emancipated slave, a round mm -hmm. woman slave, written on the back of her bill of emancipation. And I think uh, this is telling of the overall situation. And, and it includes um, 
acceptance of commandment. Yeah. Which is a discussion in Robin Hood's process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, she, is, she must go through this, but we use a different term. Okay. Um, okay, now bills of emancipation, like bills of divorce and, and some to what were written on parchment, not paper. Uh, and like Tubot and Gitim, they were meant for preservation and presentation. They had social and legal meaning. They were preserved because of their social necessity, because of the work they could do uh, in court or in the community. Conversion certificates of Gitim were either not produced in the same scale or in any case not preserved to the same case, which means that there was not, not as much social need for them to be preserved and presented, not at least, uh, as in the same scale as a bills of emancipation. One reason a bill of emancipation might come in, uh, uh, might come in handy in the is the recurring phenomenon attested in dozens of Geniza manuscripts, as well as legal queries to the Geonim and Maimonides, is the phenomenon of suspicion around the emancipation or the lack thereof, uncertainty as to the religious identity of the enslaved and the emancipated, mm -hmm. and even the exact circumstances under which an emancipated woman had conceived. And I refer to the Minister Kahana words <laughs> yesterday about who exactly do we care about? Um, age. Yes, fertility. <laughs> In such a social reality, a formal and signed bill of emancipation yeah. stating explicitly that you have the right to marry into the Jewish community is extremely important. It is worth stating that uh, the problems and conflicts uh, around the legal uh, identity of emancipated people and their children, and even in one case that I'm aware of, their grandchildren, resulted not only from social suspicion, different socioeconomic status, or uh, prejudices against uh, aliens of various kinds. Again, these are documents and contemporaneous response are revealed that some enslaved people were indeed never emancipated formally with the ritual immersion and the formal bill from the court, uh, but actually were integrated into the Jewish community through concubinage, marriage, how can they marry without a bill, this is exactly the problem, or parenthood, and based on their close familiarity with Jewish life and culture living in Jewish households. It was exactly their liminal situation, no longer Gentiles and not yet Jewish, which enabled both their suspicion and the below the radar integration. We can call this phenomenon social conversion, uh, the term coined um, by Ashok Cohen for modern Israel. In such a reality of ongoing suspicion, there was an urge to show that you are not paperless, right? And you have all the documentation that you need in order to prove that you are a true and full convert to Judaism. Um, there are also, a few cases of suspicion of proselytes, but they are far fewer than the cases of suspicion of emancipated people in, in Giza sources. And they are very schematic, not detailed. Um, they do not specify what is the suspicion, why, who the persons are, what are their circumstances, and they are all thoroughly rejected by the rabbinic authorities which, uh, which were addressed in the cases. So as part of the suspicion, we should pay attention to the passive tone of the term, meshukhar, Okay, Meshuchar um, or were not did not convert, they were converted. And these are also the Arabic word, verbs that they use. Gayaraha or Gayaraha, it's not really sure, but Blau says maybe it's even Gayaraha, Milshon Gier. As opposed to the stories of proselytes, when we do have stories of Girim, they are presented as very active agents choosing. Uh, worthy and so on. And the um, emancipated people are emancipated by someone else. Another comment is about the gender gap, which you discussed. If you try to identify the emancipated, um, like individually in the Geniza, the number of emancipated women is double the number of emancipated men. And if we focus on documents concerning uh, doubt and suspicion about emancipated persons, they are all about women. All Geniza documents uh, the, uh, of cases of suspicion are about women. And in Gaonic Responsa, there's one about a male um, suspected slave or emancipated. But not in all aspects, Gerim and Shukharim were different. After all, they were 
both newcomers uh, in the process of integrated into Jewish communities uh, of medieval Egypt. So both Gerim and Meshucharim received a charity from the communal funds. In charity lists, they appear among other needy persons. There's no separation between immigrants, proselytes, disabled, elderly, emancipated. It also seems that they did not receive charity as Gerim or Meshucharim, but as needy persons in the community. The sums or goods given to them uh, seem to be equal to others. Both Gerim and Meshucharim, as you can see here, married uh, cradle Jews, um, to use Paula Tartakov's term, uh, both men and women. Um, the terms were used were different. Like I said, uh, former ownership was occasionally uh, mentioned. Sometimes there was a conflict later, as I said. Um, both children of uh, both the children of Gerim and Meshucharim were sometimes called the son of the girl, the son of the daughter of the Meshucharat, uh, carrying an implicit social stigma, mostly in the case of Meshucharim, uh, or much more in the case of Meshucharim, but there was, there was no evidence for this identification lasting for more than one generation, both for Birim and Meshucharim. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I want to give you three examples um, of cases revolving around, specifically around this thin line between the two kinds of, of converts to Judaism in medieval Egypt. They, uh, they and the Jews around them try to play with this thin line, um, this un uncertainty and liminality. They were fully aware of it. And I believe it's a nice demonstration to the effect uh, which the existence of two labels for converts to Judaism uh, had in that time and place. So the first example is the beautiful emancipation of Ashu, an enslaved woman from Malaba, West India. It was written in Mangalo, West Indian coast in, on 1132. Her owner, Abraham ben Iju, was a prominent Jewish merchant. Um, he spent 70 years, 17 years in Mangalo. And it seems that during this period, he purchased Ashu. Apparently, her emancipation was a, a legal step in legitimizing an intimate, intimate relationship they had. And it seems that she was the mother of his children. It's not written explicitly anywhere. Mm -hmm. This might explain why we find several writings of this Beniju in favor of converts to Judaism, specifically of emancipated persons, and specifically about cases of suspicion of emancipated persons uh, in Judaism. And this might explain why in this uh, Ashu's uh, Bill of Emancipation, she is explicitly called Giyoret. And this is the only Bill of Emancipation which identifies the emancipated as girl in Giyoret. Um, it's, not, it's not even the only Bill of Emancipation, it's the only Karo document, Kenisa document of any kind which ex explicitly does so. Um, it is also the only Bill of Emancipation of, or any kind of Kenisa document which attaches to the emancipated uh, the patronym uh, Bat Avraham, Ben Avraham. Mm -hmm. This is always for Gerim. This is the only case where it's done for a Meshukar, a Tom mm -hmm. And lastly, this is the only bill of emancipation which includes a new Hebrew name, Bracha, which the convert chose or was chosen for her. All the emancipation bills mention the right to choose a name, but they do not mention an actual name given. And if we have mentions of, of names later on, usually the, for women, these are usually Arabic names because also Jewish women had Arabic names or nicknames. And here she is given, um, she's mentioned as Giorat, daughter of Abraham with the new Hebrew name, in contrast to Gerim and in contrast to all other Meshuchem that we know of. And I think this, is probably, this probably stems from the specific social, specific circumstances of Abraham and his wife. A second He's example. His daughter. What? He's also his daughter. Also his daughter? Yeah. But Abraham. Abraham. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A second example is that of Akramia. Uh, an unsigned testimony from early May 1217 testifies that Akramia, here I quote, who was raised in the house of Sheikh al-Assad, the esteemed physician, is not a descendant of the people of Israel. And she, lo mamzeret velo netina velo shukit velo bdukit, categories from the Mishnah and Kiddushin, which we already discussed, uh, which categories problematic for marriages uh, for Jews. Now, what is this document? Someone bothers to testify that someone else is not a Jewess, but also not prohibited from marriages to a Jew, and she was raised in the house of an esteemed member in the Jewish community. Now, luckily, uh, the Geniza has preserved a previous draft of uh, the same testimony with erasures and things that didn't get, reach the final text and even a date 
from 10 days uh, earlier, uh, late April, 12, 17. Thank you for them for dating and for preserving <laughs> the date. And here, the person who wrote the draft of the testimony added additional legal categories from the same Mishnah, stating that Akumia is also not a giyoret velo shifcha velo meshukheret. Lo shifcha velo giyoret velo meshukheret. But these words were crossed out and were not included in the later version, uh, probably because uh, they couldn't testify for it, right? So what we have here is actually something like the game, tell me without telling me, you know? So tell me that you're an, em an emancipated slave eligible for marriages for a Jew without telling me so. The testimony <laughs> is drafted twice. People were probably summoned to testify and to sign. And all this is in order to walk the fine line between qualifying a Crimea for marriages, but not labeling her as an emancipated person. This testimony leaves her identity open for some speculation. Is she a Giyoret or a Meshukharet? I claim that if she was a Giyoret, there was no need to conceal it, or in any case, there was no need to cross out the words Lo Shifcha Velo Meshukharet. Right, because she indeed wasn't Shifcha or Meshukharet. But, but if she was an emancipated person and people did not want her to suffer from the low status of emancipated persons versus Grim, such a testimony would be a useful tool uh, for that goal. A third and last example uh, is found in a partial and torn question. Oh, sorry, here it is. <laughs> um, partial and torn question to an uh, anonymous uh, authority. We do not know who. It's in the writing, handwriting of one of the scribes of Maimonides. Maybe it's Maimon, part of Maimonides' response. Maybe it's just a copy of a previous response. Um, it concerns a woman who was wed to a Jewish man, but, but the Jewish congregation protested and claimed that she was an enslaved woman and so needed a formal emancipation um, bill before she could be married. The future husband said that he will not marry her if she gets a bill of emancipation. Uh, and the alleged owner claimed that she was not enslaved at all and that she converted uh, on her own. Okay. Uh, in fact, he doesn't use the words convert, uh, but he says the Judaize, the Howadat, okay, which is not the verb that we usually find. Mm -hmm. So this last example, can we can see several of the points I was making uh, through the, throughout the talk. The liminal status of convert of enslaved people even before formal emancipation, the integration into Jewish community by means of marriage the occasional lack of formal procedures of emancipation by a Jewish court. The negative stigma of emancipated people, which caused the future husband to refuse to let his future wife get a formal bill of emancipation. The suspicion on the, on the part of at least some members of the Jewish community. And finally, the ability of the alleged owner to play in the gap between Gerim and Meshukharim and claim that the woman in question, who in any case was a newcomer to the Jewish community, should not be labeled as Meshukharet, but as Giorit uh, or um, Judaizer, yeah, the Hawada, by her own, by on her own, not as a result of her enslavement and her master's decision to emancipate her and therefore bring her to Judaism. So to conclude, and sorry for taking more time than I would have planned, in medieval Egypt, converts were uh, to Judaism were a known phenomenon. Uh, when phenomena, these people uh, converted to Judaism and were eventually integrated into the Jewish community in two distinct social processes. Conversion, out of religious conviction probably, of which we know almost nothing, and enslavement and cohabitation in Jewish households until emancipation, of which we also do not know too much. We do know that enslaved people were suspected before and even after the emancipation and official conversion. We know that some did not go through the whole formal process of conversion. And we know that Jewish society made a clear distinction between the two kinds of converts after their conversion. The suspicion of enslaved and emancipated people caused some of them and their Jewish supporters to blur the exact circumstances of their conversion and try to pass as Gerim. It is reasonable that some of them even succeeded and are still hiding in my list of uh, Gerim and uh, Geniza. And eventually, both Gerim and Meshukharim were fully integrated into the Jewish society, married other Jews, functioned in the community, and after a generation or so, were fully assimilated to the point that we cannot see uh, trace them anymore in the documentary or record from the Karagoniza. Thank you very much.
fascinating, really uh, very interesting paper. Please, questions. Daniela. Thank you, Moshe. Wonderful as usual. Um, you did not explain who those converts or slaves were beforehand. Who did, were, were Jews allowed to call Muslim slaves? As far as I know, no. not. Yes. And you should say something about that and about the a possibility of, con of Muslims to convert into Judaism. It's also very problematic, right? Yeah. And, and I think you should say something about that. Um, I'd like to ask you about the suspicion you mentioned. Is it suspicion towards the mo motivation of the convert or rather his fidelity or her fidelity um, to the community or to the religion, if you, if you can at all make a distinction? Yeah. Um, and two more small questions. You, you mentioned um, that I, I, but I wasn't quite sure if it's conceptually or, or practically that the Muslim um, a, a concept of, of uh, retaining the ties between the master and his emancipated slave trickled into the Jewish consciousness. But did you actually find cases of um, claiming, as you said, property? And so did this happen before Muslim court, before Qadi, rather than? In the Jewish court, because mm -hmm. we know that right there was this legal pluralism that enabled Jews to go to the Kadi. And last comment, um, maybe you could say uh, your you have your intake on it. Um, I remember learning from Goytain that the fact that documents are not found in the Geniza do not point to their unimportance, but rather the opposite. Because the Gnisa is like the trash where you, where you trash your documents, and the really important documents, the ones you would hang on your wall, did not uh, were not thrown away; they kept them home, and therefore they were underrepresented in the in the Gnisa. Uh, can I just add to your, your second question about the suspicion? I also don't like saying about the time period, and I, you just said suspicion. I want to I want to hear more what you meant by that, but also. You mentioned the gender aspect of that suspicion. So why would you suspect more women? I don't know if it's representative of what you said, but uh, uh, I'm tagging along to Daniela's question and want to know why would you think there's a gender difference when, you, when we're talking about suspicion? Okay. So, and also, uh, so, so let's, uh, let's just stop with these <laughs> questions now and let the- uh, Okay, uh, so, so many very good questions so uh, who are the gerim and uh, who were they before we do not know uh, mostly uh, gerim usually the guinness documents do not talk about uh, the past right and also and it fits you know uh, once he's a girl he's a newborn um, we, we do not talk about his past there are every, like two exceptions when this past is just good uh, too, too good to to conceal <laughs> i was a previous i was a priest and i had a very high status uh, but usually it's a, it's, it's very um, schematic um who are the slaves um so craig perry has a, a whole dissertation uh, he wrote about um the enslavement and and life as slaves according to carbonist documents and contemporary sources uh, so some were from from uh, the Sudan and Ethiopia, so uh, uh, black slaves, some were Indian slaves, like this Ashu, uh, some were um, uh, Byzantines or, or from beyond, from the Caucasus, slaves that you can find in the market. Um, and for them, it's of course, it's slaves in general, this whole process of uh, deracination, and uh, it's not important, right? Um, even more so than, 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 than Gerim. Uh, of course, uh, Non-Muslims cannot um, own Muslim slaves. Um, and this was also a tool. If a slave wanted to get out of the hand of his non-Muslim owner, he could convert to Islam. This would not free him. He will just be, uh, be um, sold uh, to a Muslim owner. Okay, but if he was not satisfied with his owner, this is something he could potentially do. Um, but but Jews and Christians could have uh, Christian uh, slaves, pagan slaves from India, from Black, Black Africa, and so on. Uh, so the suspicion, suspicion is usually, uh, it's not about, first of all, what, what it's not about. It's not about sincerity because the, this issue is not, 
relevant. It's not relevant at all. The suspicion is mostly about a, a sexual intercourse uh, of the Jewish male owner with um, with the female slave. And this is why it's gender. before manumission. But before manumission, if there was any manumission, or why did you want to manumit her? Or you we do have the testimony of that you really manumitted her, and yeah, only after did. that your daughter was born. The question is. Uh, 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 he is a, a he is a male Jewish male owner. He has a, a female slave. Um, they married. They live happily, and they have a daughter. Did he manumit his slave before that? And if so, then their daughter is his daughter and Jewish, or he did not give her a bill of emancipation. So she is a slave and non-Jewish, and the daughter is a slave and not Jewish, not, and so we cannot. It's not only before the birth that. When the, the con, when the doctor was convinced, conceived, it's also yeah. Important. So there's even one not, uh, there's one document of of someone. He has a mature daughter, and he brings and he is asked to bring testimony that she is the daughter of from uh, his wife, which is an emancipated slave, which he owned, uh, and not the daughter that she had before when he purchased her. Now she's mature, so it happened at least a decade ago. And he brings the witnesses that he did manumit his his deceased wife, which once was his uh, his uh, female so, slave. Yes, I'm not speaking only and, about uh, it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after this is, you know, uh, the the judges are convinced. They ask the the witnesses brought from Ashkelon to Egypt to testify. They say, do you know how much time passed between the manumission and the, the birth? Yes. And they say, oh, we cannot remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the suspicion. Uh, it's All the cases are around that. Uh, is there a bill of manumission? And was there a, 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 a sexual intercourse and it, it should also disqualify the, the slave. Never. Mind. It's not about whether she wants to be Jewish out of the, love or nothing. It's want, just about want or desire or conviction is nothing is not mentioned at all. Um, um, practical the model for so I talked with the L uh, yesterday after the her talk about the subject. We have a query to uh, Abraham, the son of Moses Maimonides. And they say uh, there was a, a meshuchelet here, and she uh, died, and she willed her, her small property to two female friends. Uh, but we know, uh, and so sorry, and her former owner is in some financial difficulties now, and he wants this property. Okay, <laughs> and we know that uh, according to Jewish halacha, he is not entitled because and this property is already with these two women. And Abraham Mondis responds that indeed this is the halacha, but we can ask them, and if they are willing, they can give their this property to the former owner who is a very esteemed member of the community. And the former owner um, threatens to appeal to the Gentile court. Who is Muslim court? Who will say yes? Of course, he has. He is entitled to the property, right? I, I also want to comment. It's actually uh, in Roman law, uh, the property should go to the master. So, and also in Islamic law, some of the property should go to the to the master because he's also the patron. He's really the patron. He's also taking care of his former slave. So, yeah. More questions. At first, you had one before uh, already. Two very short questions. Thank you very much. The last document you discussed, which has the testimony that she Judaized by herself. Are you sure that's a statement in favor of her now being Jewish and not one which is meant to disqualify her from being Jewish because she mm -hmm. only Judaized by herself and that doesn't count? And the other question is, in the text of the manumission document that you brought, does it really say that she is becoming Jewish or the details there have more to do with what claims we don't have against you and what rights we don't have vis-a-vis -vis you. And then when you say that on the back of one of these documents, you have another text which testifies specifically to conversion, I'm asking, is it really clear to you that the writ of manumission includes the notion that now she is at this time becoming Jewish? Or is that something to impose on us from halachot that you know from us? No, sorry, if you can answer again the second question. Is it the case that the bill of manumission, which you quoted in Goytan's translation, specifies and as a legal act declares a woman is now Jewish? Or is it only declaring that we no longer have any claims vis-a-vis -vis you? Neither mm -hmm. I nor my heirs nor my agents have any claims. Mm -hmm. And 
and pointing to the fact that another copy of a bit of manumission had, as you said on the back, a document testifying to conversion, which seems to imply that the first side doesn't really testify to conversion. So mm. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so um, converted on her own uh, is the, the argument of the alleged owner. So the community or something says, no, she was your slave. And so you need to give her a bill of manumission. He says, no, she wasn't my slave at all at any point. She is just, she tahawadat. So she Judaized. So he, he gives her the agency. She's not something that I own and I convert. She is a free person who decided to convert. And, and, and the- I'll tell, you, I'll tell you my question comes very briefly. In Greek and in Hebrew, I'll say this also to Marcena, I think usually when somebody's Nietzsche hate or Judaized, it means he didn't really become a Jew. He was pretending he was pretending like those people at the end of Esther. No, yeah, in, it, in when, Esther too, there are many interpretations that it yeah. doesn't mean pretending. Oh, so I think that this is the case. It's a problem again of of, uh, of doing this conference in English, right? When the sources are not in English. Yeah. So Judaized, I say, and I know I knew when I wrote it's you know, it rings all the bells, of course, for second demo period, but Tahawad is, is um, we find this verb uh, in Arabic sources from the time to become Jewish. Uh, not so much in the Jewish sources, which you say Gayalaha, but in other sources, in, in Arabic sources, Tahawada, because they also use Yahudi yes. and, and rabbinic sources, not so much. Um, but it's clear that this is the claim of the alleged owner to say, I am not the owner, she is not a slave, she is Whatever implicitly she is a girl. She and now and then to do it um, to go to your first question. So I the translation is only of part of the get, which is which I gave. Goitan has the, the entire translation, and we have others, and they are totally but according to the formula that you find with Gonic sources and so. And so it's not just that <coughs> paragraph of, of about claims. It's about uh, you can choose a new name and yeah, and so on. And so we assume if we find all these bills of, of emancipation and we find Meshukharim integrated into Jewish society that this, and, and this is what was required according to Allah, that this was their, their conversion certificate. What is unusual is this uh, description of immersion of like the actual, like you have the, the, the legal document and you have the ritual, the physical ritual. But as I said, this is the only one, and it was preserved because it's written on the parchment of the bill, which was preserved. Um, it's not to say that it didn't, did not happen, but this is the only documentation that we have. And I think it survived because they wanted to preserve uh, the bill of money mission, which maybe goes back to your question, mm -hmm. which I didn't ask about. Uh, so Shtamrut uh, in the Geniza is a very tricky question. We do not know. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody will agree today with what Goitan wrote because, okay, yeah, they preserved it. But after three generations, five generations, eventually it came either to a garbage summer or mm -hmm. to the Geniza. Okay, also the Gitim. This is why I compared it to Gitim, to to boat, to, to other stuff. Uh, but this is all that we have. Is that fine? Uh, uh, thank you, fabulous. And, and the liminality that you that you pointed to is based on the social history analysis. Quickly, a couple of uh, larger thoughts that might underlie some of this. Uh, based on the Torah itself, freeing a Canaanite slave is not permitted except under particular circumstances. That might explain very well why you will find more of these kinds of things regarding slaves, or at least begin to explain, than Geirim. There's no prohibition in the Torah to have a care. To the contrary, the Torah tries to uh, welcome them. Uh, Canaanites, free Canaanites, forget that everybody did it. There's a Torah issue. He knows a, a Pasuk issue. And of course, that's expanded upon to Rosh Pen. That might account for that. One. Two, um, as far as specificity in Shtarot, and you quoted a number of your cases, were in Gitin Biktubot. So we know that when it comes to Gitin, the specificity and the precision is overarching, whether it's in terms of making sure there's no mistake. And so that might explain why we are over precise. And there are ways, by the way, to indicate Geirut in a more subtle way. And that then spills over to Ketubot as well. So those documents might be covered again by some of these conventions. And even Shtarot, 
sometimes the issue is, you know, the, the question of writing last names into things today, you know, uh, you want to make sure it's not, you know, Yitzhak ben Abraham, Ploni Almoni, it's this one. So I, I, you have to be careful there mm-hmm. to look at the, formula, the formulations. And um, one quickie, uh, suspicion of the woman here, Shifcha Harufa, Shifcha Necheret Leish. Again, the Torah itself starts with the case of somebody, a slave. We don't know if she's a freed slave, not a freed slave. And there are, there are actually very complicated sukyot here, where, again, it might produce some of these issues. That, and that's why there's much more focus on the woman than the man. The Torah, it's, I mean, like, obviously, some of it is quite logical. But that, and the final point, um, in terms of why we might find more to Zot Shichur than to Zot Gerut, to Zot Gerut, Bateidin might have done the to Zot Gerut. They might have done the Shichur as well. It's enough for them to preserve the record. The ger doesn't have to carry the, the get out of paganism uh, card. I'm making a joke. The evit uh, the evit mishuchrar. There are implications for form. There are property issues. In other words, the ger. Nobody will say, "Hey, wait, you can't become a ger because you you know you 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 have have a job from before. It's between you and God, you and the beit din, you know, you and the fan, whatever it is." Whereas gitei uh, shichrur have all kinds of financial implications and ownership implications, and that might be a simple way to explain, at least in part, why yeah. these appear. Uh, yeah, just thoughts. Can I? Can I uh, uh, yes, so, please, so and thank, then we will break. Okay, so thank you very much. Just for about yeah. specifically in, in Shtarot, I totally agree with you, but, but this is my point. It means that everybody knew that Sitel Bait was the daughter of Muaf or Kamashukha, so they remember it. So otherwise, it wouldn't be useful to specify it in the in the bill in the court. And since we find it in I don't know dozens of of bills, and we find it also in places where it's what is not required, letters, charity lists. So we say, okay, these people were indeed identified. If they were identified, we need to use it in the legal in the legal records. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, and later we can talk on overlap okay. yeah, or later on. So we break for coffee for a short while. Thank you. 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 Thank